In this lecture, we'll talk about directed evolution. Protein engineering, rational design, requires structural and functional knowledge. And proteins are complex, fragile, poorly defined, highly interconnected. As a result, it's easy to mess up the proteins by mutating essential residues, and it's really hard to even predict beneficial changes, even if you know s structure. So there are three categories by which you can identify proteins or um, develop proteins. The first is discovery, in which you identify natural proteins from nature um, that have already been evolved, and you identify the one that has the function that you want. An alternative is recombination of naturally evolved proteins. So you can take proteins from nature and do in, in vitro recombination and then identify a reco recombined protein that can actually um, uh, do the function that you want. And then comes directed evolution, of which you take a single protein from nature, you then uh, introduce div diversity, and then you actually evolve it in vitro to generate an evolved protein for the particular function that you want. This process of directed molecular evolution um, mimics that of natural evolution. So natural evolution, um, evolution coined by Charles Darwin, essentially takes a time scale of thousands of millions of years to go from one starting point to another more fit and evolved protein or, or a species in the case of Charles Darwin. Directed evolution um, is, is similar to natural evolution. Instead, the time scale is reduced from thousands of millions of years to weeks or months so that you can go from a protein introduce mutations, go to another protein, introduce another mutation, and constantly go through this iterative cycle of introducing mutations and selecting at each step to generate a protein of, uh, it, that has been evolved. Essentially, the process of natural evolution has three uh, key, key important features. One is that you have to introduce mutation, and then introduce recombination, and then selection. So that process is taken and um, used in directed evolution so that we can shorten the time scale uh, from millions of years to weeks to months. Directed evolution allows us to explore enzyme functions never required in the natural environment and for which the molecular basis is poorly understood. This bottom-up design approach contrasts with the more conventional top-down one in which proteins are tamed rationally using computers and site-directed mutagenesis, which we've discussed before. So in directed evolution, you start off with your parent protein, shown here, isolating its gene, introducing right, mutations. That was, step, that was one step that's borrowed from evolution, and as well as recombination. This DNA of a library is then transformed back into cells so that the protein is generated. And then you introduce a selection or screening to see if this product is more fit. So if it is more fit, you say yes, and then here's your evolved protein, of which then you use as a starting point to introduce another set of mutations and recombination, transform them into cells, generate the protein, and undergo selection or screening. The ones that are not fit, you actually throw out, and so you're only identifying ones that are m improved, and you go through this iterative cycle so that you get to a highly evolved protein. So in this directed evolution a lecture, We've, I've introduced the process of directed molecular ev evolution. We're going to be talking about methods to generate large populations of variants or protein mutants, otherwise known as libraries. Two methods that we'll be talking about is localized mutagenesis as well as random mutagenesis. Uh, methods to identify isolate protein mutants with desired properties. We're going to talk about screening assays as well as selection strategy, including phage and ribosome display.
And then we'll look at case studies of protein engineering by molecular evolution through looking at cases of cytolysin, improving its thermostability, and the binding affinity and specificity of antibodies. So before we talk about mutagenesis strategies, well, let's look at the genetic code. Well, is the code universal? Well, sort of. Mitochondria tend to be a little bit different. Um, but, and UAA may code for tryptophan instead of termination, as there are three stop codons. But in general, it's pretty, it's pretty universal. The code is heavily redundant. Remember, there are 64 codons encoding for 20 amino acids due to the Crick-Wobble hypothesis. The third base makes little difference, and the first two bases have six hydrogen bonds, and the third base is irrelevant, irrelevant and that's why there's degeneracy of the codons. So there are different types of mutation. A mutation is any change in the DNA base sequence. If we're looking at your normal uh, sequence, A, G, C, which encodes for serine, if that C is mutated into T, the codon has changed, but yet it produces the same amino acid. This is called a silent mutation. If you mutate this A into a G, it's GGC. This encodes for proline. So that um, leads to a missense mutation because now you've mutated the serine into a proline. And then in the case of uh, G mutating into T, it leads to a stop codon, and, and this is called a nonsense mutation because it terminates uh, the protein synthesis. You can also have insertions where you're adding or uh, another um, base into the sequence or deletions where you're removing it. And you can have inversions, AGC is, and CGA is an, is an inversion of this uh, AGC sequence. As you've seen this before, the standard genetic code, like I said, there's a degeneracy of codons in which you have 64 codons encoding for 20 amino acids and then three stop uh, uh, signals. Um, so this shows that um, you can generate all these types of uh, mutations and, and it can lead to either silent, missense, nonsense, deletions, and inversions. Frame shift mutations are, happen when you have an addition or deletion of bases in other than multiples of three. So if you have a sentence, the cat ate the rat, if you do a one base deletion, like removing that E, it becomes this, where it's gibberish, right? The results of the frame, does, frame shift does not make sense. And so um, the addition or the insertion of multiples of three bases might change an amino acid at an insertion point, but the downstream code always stays the same. So if you have a message, the red cat ate the rat, and then you actually uh, ins inserted the red portion in between the, you'd still have uh, the downstream codon staying identical, with some mutation upstream. Suppressor mutations. So suppressor mutations are mutations that cancel the effect of the first mutation. It's not a reversion, but a reversal. It may occur in the same gene, intragenic, or different gene, intergenic. In terms of int intragenic or within, a plus one frame shift can be canceled by a minus one frame shift, or improper folding compensated by another change. Interogenic, um, usually a tRNA mutation, it inserts the correct amino, a response, a, a amino acid in response to the wrong codon. So this could, this could allow for, even though the mRNA is mutated, the tRNA um, allows for adding the right amino acid in. In terms of further characterizations of types of mutations, you can have what is called a transition mutation. This is a mutation in which a purine or pyrimidine base pair is replaced with a base pair in the same purine-pyrimidine relationship. For example, GC with AT. Transversion mutations, on the other hand, is a mutation in which a purine-pyrimidine replaces a pyrimidine-purine base or vice versa. For example, GC with TA. So you should know these types of characterizations of mutations and know them well, especially for your exams. So here are the transition and transversion mutations. Uh, the transversion mutations are shown here in the red. 
where A goes to C, A goes to T, G goes to C, G goes to T. And then the transitions are, go are shown in the blue, A to G, C to T. Um, so you can have silent mutations. Here you're taking TGT to TGC, right? This leads to a synonymous uh, um, amino acid. And then you have missense mutation here in which you have TGT mutated into TGG. Um, again, the uh, T to G uh, is a uh, transverse mutation. And in the case of T to C, T to C is a transition uh, mutation. This leads to a mutation to a tryptophan. So this is a non-synonymous mutation. Nonsense mutation, TGT st mutates to TGA, converting the cysteine into a stop. T to A uh, is a transversion mutation, and this also leads to a non-synonymous mutation. So these here become non-synonymous, non where the ones over here are synonymous. I'm going to abbreviate SYN. So now that you understand the mutation, um, what is directed molecular ev evolution? It's a laboratory process whereby mechanisms employed during natural selection are employed at the molecular and single cell level to cause and then identify evolutionary adaptations to novel environmental challenges. This often includes deliberate modification of genetic sequences. So you start off with your uh, gene of interest, uh, make mutations, and then you do a selection where you identify the one the variants with desired property. And so you can go through this process iteratively. So why use this approach? To achieve the same goal as other methods of protein engineering, you need to understand protein function. And um, also improving protein properties for industry and me medicine is important. Our understanding of the relationship between protein sequence structure and function is limited. So to go from DNA and predict um, well, we already know how to get into the amino acid uh, sequence, but the predictive folding and then identify its function is very challenging. But nature is extremely successful in this proce process, and they do it through evolution. There are four requirements for successful directed evolution. One, the desired function must be physically possible. Two, the function must also be biologically or evolutionary, evolutionarily feasible. In practice, this means there, that there exists a mutational pathway to get from here to there through ever-improving variants. While we cannot know a priori what the path, that the path exists, a good experiment will maximize the likelihood. Three, you must be able to make libraries um, of mutants that's complex enough to contain rare beneficial mutations. This usually means functional expression in a suitable microorganism, such as E. coli or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is yeast. And then four, you must have a rapid screen, um, a screen that, that depends on how rare mutations leading to the desired property are and how many must be accumulated to achieve that desired result. So in addition to a screening, you can also have a selection, which, which also uh, can be done as well. So for a selection strategy, the genotype and the phenotype must be linked. All mutations are assayed in the same reaction compartment. More protein variants can be assayed then. Selection strategies are often used to isolate protein binders, such as peptides and antibodies. After isolation of the desired protein, its amino acid sequence has to be determined, and the amino acid sequence of a single protein molecule cannot be analyzed. The protein mutants have to be linked to their encoding DNA so that you can use PCR to amplify the sequence. Several strategies have been developed to link protein phenotype with its encoding genotype. The major steps in a typical directed enzyme evolution experiment are outlined here. You start off with uh, your wild type sequence, introduce mutations, and this is done via PCR mutagenesis or a recombination of more than one parent sequence. 
generate a whole set of variants which are then ligated into a host uh, vector which are then transformed into host cells and for the protein to be generated. And then clones expressing the approved enzymes are identified using a high throughput screen or in some cases by selection. And then the genes encoding the ones that are uh, improved are then isolated and the cycle goes around and round. So our case study is cetolysin and we're trying to improve the thermostability. Cetolysins are used in detergents for washing machines so they have to be acted at high temperatures and high pH. The half-life of cetolysin E is 65 degrees and it's less than five minutes. So how can we, can, how can we improve that thermostability? A homologous protease from Thermoactinomyces vulgaris has a half-life of 17 hours at 65 degrees. Why are some proteins more thermostable? Well, subtilisin E from Bacillus subtilisis and thermotase from T. vulgaris are 57% identical. There are 157 amino acid differences. Which ones are the important ones? One can do this by taking cetolysin E, um, introducing variants or through either recombination with T. vulgaris or through uh, random uh, mutagenesis, and then select for this property of having a half-life of 17 hours at 65 degrees. So the methods to generate uh, large populations of protein mutants or library are shown here. You can do random mutagenesis either through error-prone PCR. Mutagen you can use mutagenic bacterial strain or cell line. UV radiation as well as chemical mutagens. You can do recombination or DNA shuffling. Or you can do localized mutagenesis using oligonucleotide-directed mutagenesis as well as cassette mutagenesis. So in terms of random mutagenesis, this is achieved via error-prone PCR. Um, so uh, normally in PCR you use primers and then you add DNTPs and you try to have high fidelity repeating so that you can generate the same exact gene over and over again through PCR. But in error-prone PCR you're introducing mutations uh, intentionally so that you can generate a library with random mut mutations. In order to do this um, and, and make, these, make the polymerase more sick and introduce errors as it's copying the template is to increase the magnesium chloride concentration, increase the number of uh, cycles and the polymerase con concentration. You can introduce magnesium chloride, bias the nucleotide ratios, add mutagenic nucleotides, or use a polymerase with no proofreading. The drawbacks of this method of error-prone PCR is that you get multiple mutations, enzymes preferences, uh, result in a bias of putting, putting particular mutations in the gene sequence, and you're restricted um, amino acid substitution. So when you make libraries, it is important then to calculate library size, just as you had calculate library size for a solid, so for a peptide synthesis library, which we've discussed before. Um, so the number of possible variants of a protein that can be created by introducing M mutations simultaneously over N amino acids is 19 to the M times N factorial divided by N factorial minus M factorial um, times M. So, uh, so this is important. So then, for example, if you have... Uh, one amino acid being changed and you have a protein of 200 amino acids, then the, the um, equation becomes 19 to the 1. N factorial is 200. 200 minus uh, 1 becomes uh, 199 times 1 factorial uh, will lead to 3,800. And then as you increase the number, so this would be, uh, most proteins are approximately the size of 200 amino acid. If you go to four mutations, right, being changed simultaneously, you generate a library that it's incredibly large. Um, and so uh, you need to be able to 
uh, understand or generate libraries but have confidence in covering that diversity of the library. To have 95 confidence that a given number of variants is represented, the number of clones must be 10 times larger. So if you wanted to cover this diversity, you would have to multiply by, this, by 10 to get 95% confidence that you're, you have all the variants represented. So uh, satellite E has 381 amino acids, so 7,239 possible mutations within, with one substitution is possible. Just to rewrite the equation that you should know, it should be 19 to the m, then it's n factorial divided by n minus m factorial times m factorial. So that's the equation. So if we want to search protein space for a protein of 250 residues, 20 to the 250 possible sequences. So your search capacity becomes 10 to the 6 to 9. Most sequences are non-functional. Most mutations are deleterious. So you want to start something close to the target. So the best way to do this is to make small steps, one to two amino acid changes at a time, and then go through iteratively cycles so that you get, generate a, a variant with improved uh, properties. Now there's, now, there's recent evidence from Manfred Rietz's group that a high mutation rate is better, approximately three to five um, uh, mu mutations, um, but you have to screen more. So how many protein variants need to be screened to find a mutant with improved properties? Essentially, the more mutants the screens, the higher the chance to identify a mutant with the desired properties. How many mutated genes can be generated by recombinant DNA techniques? More than 10 to the 15 mutated genes can be generated in a volume of one mil. However, the number of mutated genes can be ligated into a plasmid and brought into cells is around 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th. So how many muta mutants can be tested for their properties? The number of protein variants that can be tested depends on the screening or selection techniques used a few hundred to several billion. So then the methods to identify or isolate protein mutants with desired properties become important. Um, they're separated by screening and selection strategies. So in screening assays, you can do use microtiter plate-based assays, which then can screen about 1,000 to uh, 10 to the 6. You can do colony screens, which increases that span, span from 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 8th. And then if you use facts, well, facts you can sort per hour, 10 to the 7th per hour. Selection strategy in, includes phage display, which can accommodate 10 to the 8, 10 to the 12th, and ribosome display, or mRNA slip uh, display, which is up to 10 to the 13th. What is the difference between a selection and a screen? Well, if we look at selection, if we use E. coli, and we're looking at... Um, uh, the presence of beta-lactamase. In the presence of ampicillin, E. coli normally dies, so there's no growth. However, if you have the beta-lactamase gene encoded, which actually hydrolyzes ampicillin, in the presence of ampicillin, you'll start to see colonies. So this would be a selection between no growth and growth. Screen, all cells grow, right? So in E. coli, we're looking at... Um, uh, um, the presence or, or absence of beta-galactosidase and E. coli without beta-galactosidase, and you add them on plates uh, bearing X-gal, you'll see colonies, but they're white, which are normal. But in the presence of beta-galactosidase, X-gal will turn blue, and so you start to see the blue colonies. So by, just, by identifying the blue colonies, those are screened to be the ones that have the function that is needed. So microtiter plate assays, mutants are expressed in individual wells on a microtiter plate. You can have 1296384 well plates. Activity of mutants assayed in, micro, in microtiter plates. And mutants are stored in a replica plate to explore or to express the protein variant or isolate the sequence of the encoding DNA. One can conduct a high throughput colorimetric assay in which you have a substrate that when it's hydrolyzed by the protein of interest, it forms uh, 4-nitroaniline, which is yellow, and you can detect it. 
So now we can go back to our directed evolution of cetolysin, improving its thermostability. What was done was mutagenesis, error-prone PCR, ligation of the mutant genes into a plasmid, and transformation into E. coli. After um, it's transformed, isolate the DNA, um, and transform them in bacillus subtilis. They're grown in microplates, and the supernatin, which has the secreted protein, is used for colorimetric assay. Pellets, or the cells, are used to recover genes, and then DNA shuffling of the best uh, genes are done, and then this is repeated for six generations. So you can start off with here. You have the best top five um, variants, shuffle them, identify a single sequence, introduce mutations through error-prone PCR, identify a better one, again, introduce error-prone PCR, and identify the best. The other method of introducing diversity is DNA shuffling. Uh, pioneered by Stemmer. Using artificially generated mutants, for example, variants selected from a library, um, you can have multiple related uh, parents, which are then fragmented with DNA1, and then they're pieced together to generate a like, recombinant library of different pieces being uh, pieced together, and you identify the ones uh, that have the best uh, function, ide identifying beneficial mutations. Use, you can also do shuffling using homologous genes from a protein family, with, and in this case, a high homology need, is needed. Here you have homologous sequences. They're chopped up, and then they're pieced together in, in ways um, that hasn't been pieced together before. So going back to the example of cetolysin, error-prone PCR was done, 5,000 variants screened for survival at 65 degrees, five best variants were shuffled to recombine mutations, 8,000 screened at 75 degrees, error-prone PCR of the best variant, 2,000 screened at 76, shuffling of the best three variants, 3,000 screened at 78, error-prone PCR of the best variant, and 2,000 screened at 80 degrees, leading to a single sequence. So the result here was that eight mutations cause a 200-fold increase in the half-life of 65 at 65 degrees, shown here, um, which is excellent, uh, the, uh, as shown here. And so through these various cycles, they were able to obtain a cetolysin that was thermostable indeed. So when when the mutants were uh, re recast onto the actual protein um, fold, we see that the mutations that were identified that improved thermostability could have never been protective. They're on the surface. They're not really interacting with one another. And as a result, directed evolution allows one to do so without, um, without needing to know the actual structure. Um, and being able to identify a solution that could never be predicted. There are alternative methods of screening protein activity, colonies of a nutrient plate. Here, mutants are expressed in individual colonies on a nutrition plate. Activity is measured directly on the plate by adding the substrate that changes its color. The protein is active. Before the activity assay, the replicate plates are produced to express the protein variant and isolate the sequence DNA. FACTS, or fluorescence-activated cell sorting, is another method for screening protein activity. Here, what you have are mutants expressed in individual cells. Cells expressing the active protein variants are then fluorescently labeled. Cells are then sorted according to their fluorescence intensities, as shown here. And so you can um, take your cells and you can sort them by ones that are fluorescent versus ones that are not. So you can even have diff more than one type of fluorescent cell. So here's green and here's red uh, versus the unlabeled. And the beauty of using facts is that you can uh, sort millions of cells per hour. So let's revisit the selection strategies. We've discussed some of these already or all of these already. And so now we're looking at exploring strategies that can link protein or phenotype to its with its encoding DNA genotype. Phage display allows one to do that. And so in phage display, 
phager used to infect bacterial cells um, to generate uh, phage. And depending on whether your gene of interest is encoded either to the, uh, attached to the 8 or the 3 protein, P3 or P8 protein, you can have display either on the um, P3 side or all over on the surface of the phage. So here's an example of when you have a DNA pr uh, pr of the protein that you want to display fused to the gene 3, which is P3 protein. And so you can display those proteins. And then on, an, um, on a um, bead or a surface that's immobilized to the target of interest, you can then look for binders. And the ones that are not strong binders will wash away. And then you can isolate these that are the strongest binders. And we've talked about phage display in earlier lectures. The beauty of um, using phage display is that you can do panning. So you can start with the library of, uh, here's an antibody library on phage, and then you have um, a column that has your target of interest, and then the phage that only bind the target of interest binds to the column, and then the rest are washed away. Once you, then you can elude out that phage either with target that binds these and compete it out. And then you can amplify that gene and undergo next cycle of panning until you enrich for the um, phage uh, proteins that bind best. Ribosome display um, allows one to link genotype with phenotype. Here what happens is you, you Start with your DNA, you do in vitro transcription to generate your mRNA in vitro translation, and then that um, allows you to generate a, a ribosome that's uh, tethered to the native protein because you're, as your ribosome is coming and reading off the mRNA, you're adding pyromycin at the end, which then does not allow for the disassociation of the ribosome off the mRNA, so it's attached to the mRNA, and here's your protein. Then you can select for binding to a particular antigen or protein, and those that are, that, that are bound and are stay, and those that are not bound wash away. And so then you can specifically dissociate this complex, isolate the mRNA, and then reverse transcribe to generate the DNA and add mutations, and then go through the cycle over and over again. So ribosome display allows one to link genotype to phenotype, and you're not limited to the cell. You don't have to deal with any transfection limitations. It's all about generating uh, diversity on your DNA. And in vitro compartmentalization, you start with a gene library that is covalently attached to a substrate. And then you generate a water and oil emulsion, like an artificial cell. With the transcription and translation machinery in that uh, compartment so that the gene gets transcribed into RNA, which can transcribe into enzyme. Now, in, if that enzyme is then able to act on that substrate that's attached to the gene, usually it's a fluorescent product. You can then identify that compartment through cell sorting, as we've talked about, facts, um, and then generate or isolate the gene, and then use that to generate your new library and go through the cycle iteratively. Again, you're, you have a link to your genotype and phenotype because of this artificial compartmentalization, um, and you're able to then uh, do directed evolution in that way. Here's case study two, antibody engineering. The immune system is capable of creating millions of different antibodies, and scientists for decades have been investigating methods to recreate these systems via recombinant DNA technology. So here's antibody, which are comprised of variable regions as well as constant regions down here. And the power of antibodies comes in the strength and specificity of antigen binding, which happens over here. And this, these regions are where the antigen binds. They have dissociation constants that range from 10 to the minus 4th to 10 to the minus 10th molar. And they can be highly specific. It's the complementary determining region of an antibody that binds to the antigen, as shown here. It has this immunoglobulin unfold, and as we had seen in the Greek key motif shown here, it shows this anti-parallel beta sheets that are assembled together. It has three, um, e each one, or each uh, CDR region, has three um, loops, CDR1, CDR2, CDR3, which are hypervariable.
and um, this allows for uh, this region allows for recognition of the antigen and and high specificity binding. The antigen binding site of an antibody, shown here. Um, is comprised of six complementary uh, determining re regions, CDR, um, or hypervariable regions, three within the light chain, um, shown here, and three within the heavy chain, VH, shown here. So you can take antibody variable regions of germline segments, do DNA re rearrangements, and you can have it both on the light chain as well as the heavy chain. Um, and then you can select for antigen binding. Once you select for antigen uh, binding, those lymphocytes that produce the antigen are, are um, active, uh, active and activate antibodies and triggers the incorporation of somatic mutations in the V genes, uh, shown here. And then that allows for improved uh, binding to the antigen, to the mature lymphocyte. So uh, this process can be, can be done or used, exploited to generate really um, highly, highly uh, selective and highly um, tight binding uh, uh, proteins or that can uh, recognize the antigen. So in generating an antibody fragment binding to a specific antigen, antibody fragments SCFV libraries generated through by mutagenizing CDRs, libraries displayed on phage, you can um, selectively uh, display on phage library of uh, antibody fragments. The SCFV phage binding to a specific target or antigen or receptor is selected, and then the DNA encoding the selected SCFV proteins are sequenced, and then that one is expressed. So, so far in, our, in this process, we've discussed all the random mutagenesis uh, methods as well as some recombination DNA shuffling, but now we'll also talk about localized mutagenesis strategies. So for mutagenic oligonucleotides, if one codon is replaced with NNN, where N is equal to all the four possible bases, then the oligonucleotide is an equal mixture of 64 different sequences containing 64 different codons, encoding all 20 amino acids plus three stop codons, right? So that's NNN. Because of the degeneracy of the codon, the genetic, uh, of the genetic code, NNS or NNK, where S is equal to C or G, or K is equal to G or T, can be used instead of NNN to encode all the 20 amino acids with just 32 conons, uh, including just one stop codon. When doing so, you can generate uh, tar target mutagenesis using mutagenic oligonucleotides, in which you have a primer on one side, primer here on the mutation site, and a primer here and the primer on the other side, and then you can do PCR and then have the two fragments anneal to one another and then extend. You can also do it um, by site-directed mutagenesis, or SDM, which we talked about before, in which you make a single primer on top of, so here would be the DNA strand, and here would your, you have a forward primer where your mutation is. And then you can just uh, copy the rest so that you generate the whole plasmid bearing the mutation. So again, for mutagenic oligonucleotides, if you're using NNS codon or codon scheme, where you're using 32 codons to encode for 20 amino acids and one stop codon, if you mutate one amino acid, you get 32 uh, libraries members. If you mutate two, you would get uh, 32 to the second, which will then equal to one, uh, 1,024. If you go three, it would be 32 to the third, third, sorry, et cetera, and four, et cetera, and six, and going on. So if you look at it, as you reach the four, you are already up to one million. When you go to five, you're uh, 3.4 times 10 to the seventh, and then six times 10 to the ninth. And so you do not want to exceed 
um, the the transformation efficiency of E. coli, especially since this, if you're doing work with E. coli and generating library, protein libraries in E. coli. So uh, you want to generate uh, libraries where you have, where you limit yourself to maximum about five mutations because this would lead to a library size of 3.4 times 10 to the seventh. But if you wanted to um, uh, generate a library that had uh, that covered the diversity for uh, at a confidence level of 95%, then you would have to multiply this number by 10. And that would give you 3.4 times 10 to the 8th as your uh, theoretical diversity that, that you wanted to cover using E. coli transformation efficiency. This would be your maximum limit because going beyond, if you multiplied this number by 10, you would go to 10 to the 10th and then E. coli transformation efficiency doesn't, are not that effective. So when you're looking at papers and reading papers, you should be able to calculate confidence levels of, uh, of not necessarily confidence levels, but you should be able to calculate the theoretical diversity of a library and, uh, and, and covering that library with a confidence of 95%, and, and looking at whether papers are doing that to, make to ensure that they generate a, a diverse library that they're covering. So this ends our lecture. Um, we've talked about the different methods to uh, isolate and screen proteins, either through screening assays, we'd use microtiter plate assay colony facts, and then selection strategy, where we talked about phage display, ribosomal mRNA display, as well as in vitro IVC, in vitro uh, compartmentalization, which we discussed at the, at, towards the end. Thank you.